So um, as far as treatment options, we and other land managers use integrated pest management as an approach um, to invasive plant control. So this combines mechanical um, treatment like hand pulling or digging and chemical as well as biological control. And biological control is the use of um, competition and pred predation from other species, they're often insects. And the specific control or combination of method, um, methods used at a specific site is determined in collaboration with the land managers and it's very dependent on the site as well as the plant species. Um, yeah, so there's lots of factors to consider when um, choosing which type or combination of treatment to use at a specific site. Um, and for chemical treatment, there's very strict regulations when it comes to herbicide. Okay, so for the ID portion of this, um, we're going to focus on plants in the carrot family. So these are invasive plants like caraway, wild parsnip, poison hemlock, wild chervil, giant hogweed, and queen pan slice. Um, so I've just got one more poll, and this is kind of like a trivia question. I get you guys to answer this one now. I'm gonna give it two more seconds. Okay, so most people got it right. It is poison hemlock. Um, yeah, and this plant will go over in detail, but it, all parts of the plant are poisonous um, and can be fatal. Um, so these are some general characteristics of plants in the carrot family. Um, they're generally a biannual to perennial plant. Um, their flowers are arranged in compound umbels. Uh, their stems are usually hollow and they have a wide range of edibility. So some are very edible to deadly poisonous like poisonous hemlock. Uh, so you want to use extreme caution when you're identifying these plants and be 100% sure um, of what you're dealing with. And so, as I said, most of them have a compound umbel. So this is useful for identifying plants to the family, but not specific species. So a compound umbel um, is kind of the most distinctive pattern of the ACE family. And if you notice how all of the stems um, radiate from um, a cluster, so at the tip of the stem to a secondary kind of umbel, so that's why it's called a compound umbrella or compound umbel. And some plants in the APAC family have an edible taproot, so that's just when the primary root grows longer and thicker than the secondary roots. Um, this is versus a fibrous root system where the secondary roots continue to grow and eventually all the roots are full size. Um, and just some background on leaf structure. So uh, many plants in this family have a compound leaf. A simple leaf is un um, maybe undivided, although the margins are toothed or lobed. And a compound leaf is divided into several um, leaflets. And that's just an example there. So in the carrot family, uh, the leaf blade is usually dissected, which is that one there. Um, and these are leaves that are deeply or repeatedly cut into many portions, but are not um, divided into ind individual leaflets. And ferns are a classic example of this kind of leaf formation. Um, and the leaves are usually alternate to nearly opposite. And as I said, they're biannuals to perennials. So um, biannuals take two years to complete their life cycle. Um, and they're a rosette in the first year, and then they flower in their second year. And perennials live um, longer than two years. Okay, 
Okay, so before I go on, are there any questions in the chat box, Robin? No, we've, there was one person that had sound issues, but they, we figured oh. it out, so we're all okay. good. Perfect. All right, so this is the first plant that um, we're going to go over. It's called giant hogweed, hogweed. Um, and it's a plant that has sharply toothed leaves with hairs on the underside. It has white umbrella-shaped flowers um, and hollow stems, and it can grow two to five meters tall, so it's quite a large plant and it has highly toxic sap. So it was the plant that I showed in the, the photo previously. Uh, so it has a, a sap that is photo phytotoxic. So if you get it on your skin, um, then when you go out in the sunlight, you get severe sunburns. So it's really important to um, be cautious if you're working with this plant. And there is just one question that, that came in. I think it was with regards to the last plant. Um, Question about a perennial herb that looks like dill, question mark. Perennial herb that looks like dill. Um, I'm not sure if it's, we have a, a guide to the APACA family um, that we'll send out after, so that might help you identify. It's hard to know without, um, without photos. I don't know if Robin, if you have any guesses. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> we have to, have to know a little bit more. Lisa, feel free to send us some photos or, or be a bit more detailed there. Yeah. Um, there's another question here about um, what areas in BC does giant hogweed invest? Um, and I'll just quickly say that um, mostly the Vancouver Island and, and the lower mainland, um, but we do have a couple infestations of giant hogweed in the Columbia Shushwap region. Um, and... Uh, um, there are ways to, to figure out how to see where invasive plants are around, around the province, and, and Kim will, will cover that a bit later. Um, Lisa's going to send the picture of the plant that looks like dill, and Ashley's asking about scentless chamomile without flowers. Mm, not sure. A plant that, that could be there. looks like scentless chamomile? Yeah, <laughs> we're getting lots of good plant ID questions <laughs> coming in. I, it's a bit hard for us to just go off, you know, short descriptions in the chat box. So if you do have plant ID questions, um, more specifically than, than sending us some photos later might work well. Um, and then there's a question, which I think will lead to your next slide here. Is giant hogweed also known as cow parsnip? So maybe oh, yeah, great question. Head to the next one, yeah. Yeah. Um... So this is just a photo that you guys have already seen of what uh, what this poisonous or toxic sap can do. Um, it can also cause blindness if you get it around your eyes. So it's really, really important to, yeah, to use caution if you're around it. So yeah, cow with parsnip is a native plant that is often confused with giant hogweed. Um, it doesn't grow quite as big. So there's some, some important differences. So Cow or giant hogweed can grow two to five meters tall, whereas cow parsnip um, only grows one to two meters tall. Uh, the stem is five to ten centimeters in diameter with giant hogweed, um, whereas in cow parsnip it's only two to five centimeters in diameter. Um, giant hogweed has stiff bristly hairs, whereas cow parsnip just kind of has like a um, fuzzy hairs on the stem and the leaves. And the the leaf structure is quite different. So in giant hogweed, it's divided and it's a lot more divided and it has, uh, the leaves are quite toothed. Um, and then in cow parsnip, it's less divided and more of a pomade kind of leaf. So it kind of looks like a hand. And then in giant hogweed, there's 50 to 100 rays in the umbel. And in cow parsnip, there's only 15 to 30 rays in the umbel. So there's lots of different characteristics that you can use to um, differentiate between the two, but at first glance, um, a lot of people do think that cow parsnip is giant hogweed. Um, so this is just what um, the ray is the part that connects the central stalk to the, to the secondary umbel. So in cow parsnip, again, there's only 15 to 30 rays um, versus giant hogweed, 50 to 100 rays. Um, and I just have, another photo of what the stem looks like. So the left is the stem of giant hogweed, um, which has, 
purple spots and stiff bristly hairs. And then the right is cow parsnip and it has some purple markings, but it's mostly green and it has soft, softer kind of hairs. Um, another plant we'll talk about later is poison hemlock, which has distinct purple blotches, but it's um, much easier to di differentiate between these two. Um, it has a really different leaf structure as well as an inflorescence. So we only have two sites that we know of, of giant hogweed in our region. Um, they're both in the si uh, salmon arm IPMA and one is being treated and the other one is on private property. So we don't have any in Revelstoke or Golden that we know of. Okay. Uh, so the next plant is called Wild Shrivel. Um, and it has smooth and highly branched stems that are up to one meter tall. And it has a really deep woody root system. And it's a really prolific seed producer. can produce 13,000 seeds per plant. Um, and it outcompetes crop and forage plants, so it can be, become a really big problem in agriculture. And it's often found in wet areas, so it competes for water and nutrients. Um, so this is just a photo of the inflorescence, and then the leaves are alternate and fern-like, and they're divided into many leaflets. And then, as I said, it has a smooth, highly branched stem. Um, so when it's mature, it can form tall strands of vegetation that are unpalatable to, um, to livestock and to wildlife. And it's extremely hard to control because of um, the large taproot and woody root system and it's that, um, apparently resistant to some herbicides. So when you're removing it, it's important to remove the entire plant. Um, if you believe a bit of the, the root, it might re-sprout. Um, but repeated mowing um, before it's gone to seeds can help reduce the, or deplete the root system. So there's a few sites in Salmon Arm, as well as one in the Revelstoke IPMA that's actually in Mica Creek. So it's in the, the north kind of reaches of our, of the Revelstoke region. And there's just and, a request to go back to, oh, sorry, you can finish maybe what you're gonna say and then maybe oh. go back to the wild travel info slide again. Okay. Um, and then uh, someone's asked about where giant hogweed comes from in its native range. I'd actually look it up. It comes from the Caucasus Mountains in West Central Asia, where it grows in subalpine meadows and forest edges. <laughs> there, we're going back to the wild gerbil info slide. And I think, um, Kim, will you be sending out some, some summary, like the information about some of these plants so people don't need to scramble to take notes there'll be some yeah some I'll send out um, we have a guide that we can send out as well as some some info sheets um, but yeah you can feel free to take notes as well um, yeah I think I'm gonna I'll keep going but we do yeah we will send out some, some tip sheets so you can have um, all of this information after as well. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's six sites in total in our region. So there's not, not too many. Okay, so caraway um, entered Canada as a spice crop. Um, it has alternate leaves that are really finely divided. Um, and it has a parsnip-like taproot that has black skin and a white core, as you can see in this photo. Um, it has groups of small white flowers at the top, um, and it can grow 60 to 90 centimeters. And the flowers are sometimes pinkish, so that can be one thing you could use to ID it. Um, it's native to Eurasia, and as I said, it entered Canada as a spice crop, but it's escaped cultivation. And although it's edible, it's not utilized by livestock or wildlife. Um, and it can quickly displace the uh, natural vegetation, as well as it infests um, crops. And um, then the seeds can be dispersed through baled hay. Okay. 
And we just have three sites that we know of in our region, and two of them are in Glacier National Park along the highway. Um, one of them is actually at the Discover, Discovery Center parking lot. Um, and then the other one is just one site in Golden. Okay. Um, so I spoke a little bit about poison hemlock before. Um, it has really distinctive purple blotches on the stem. Uh, it's extensively branching plants, so, and it grows 0 0.5 to 3 meters tall. It has robust hollow stems um, that are hairless and smooth with those purple uh, blotches. And it has bright green triangular leaves that are finely divided and fern-like. Um, and it also has a really strong musty odor. And it has the classic kind of small white flowers with a um, umbrella-shaped inflorescence, and they can be uh, half a meter wide. So all parts of poison hemlock are extremely toxic to humans as well as to animals, uh, so they, it can cause serious illness and um, can be fatal if it's consumed. So it's a plant to be very careful about. You don't even want to touch it with your bare skin. Um, and in these plants can be, uh, you can have adverse skin reactions to any kinds of plants. So it's really important just to make sure that you're always using caution when you're working around them. Um, so these are just some more detailed photos of the, the leaf structure. So it has that highly branched um, leaves that are kind of burn-like and they're, they have a really bright green color as well as the stems that have those distinctive kind of um, purple blotches, and the stems are hairless and smooth and hollow. Uh, we have quite a few sites in Salmon Arm, um, and then we also have one site in Revelstoke, as well as, um, oh sorry, we have one site in Golden. There's just a question here from Rob about poison hemlock growing in wet locations, and I'd say the answer is is yes, for sure. It grows in a lot of wet, wet uh, ditches and things like that. Hey, Kim. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it's usually in kind of wet areas. Is that the only question? Yep, that's it. Cool. Okay, so the next plant is called wild parsnip. And like giant hogweed and other members of the carrot family, it produces the sap um, that can cause sensitivity to sunlight um, that results in burns or blisters and rashes. So it's, yeah, you wanna be completely covered if you're working around this plant. Uh, it can grow up to 1.5 meters tall and it has a smooth stem with a few hairs. And the distinctive feature for this plant is it has a bright yellow inflorescence versus a lot of the other ones that have white flowers. And the leaves are quite distinct too. They have um, kind of a mitten shape and they're sharply toothed. Um, and here's just some photos of the wild parsnip. So as you can see, it has the compound umbrella, but they're yellow flowers. And then the leaves are kind of sharply toothed and more of a, a mitten shape. So we have a few sites in Salmon Arm. And then one site in Revelstoke that we know of. And then a few in our Golden IPMA. Um, and these are mainly just along the highway. Uh, the next plant is called Queen Anne's Lace, and it's a biennial herb that um, grows two to four feet tall, and it actually smells um, and apparently tastes like carrot. Uh, the leaves are pinnately divided into deeply dissected narrow segments, so it has a really feathery kind of delicate look. Uh, so that's one way that it's different than the other plants in this family. Um, the stems are hairy and hollow, and it has a uh, slender woody taproot and it often has just one solitary pink or purple flower in the middle of the inflorescence. Okay. 
So these are the uh, the leaves and they're very delicate or lace-like and they kind of have a feathery appearance. Um, yeah, as you can see, it just kind of, uh, the inflorescence is pretty similar, but you'll often found, find just one uh, purple flower in the center. Um, we have a few sites in Salmon Arm as well as uh, one of the Golden IPMA. Okay. So we've got a couple of quizzes now, but maybe I'll uh, take some time to answer any questions right now before we go into these, if there are any. I'm not seeing anything come in the chat box yet, but there was someone, someone had asked about the Latin name for poison hemlock. So I just put that in the chat box. Okay. Um, I'll let you know if anything else comes up here. Maybe time to start the quiz. Yeah, I will start the quiz. Okay, so there's just three plants and then you can um, choose what you think is the plant that's in the photo. Give it a few more seconds. And then for the last one, Kind of hard to see in this photo, but there might be one small purple flower in the middle of the inflorescence. Okay, give it three more seconds. Okay. So the first one is giant hogweed. Uh, the second one is caraway, and then the third one is Queen Ansley, so most people got it right. i do a quick summary of those key ID, ID um, components here. <laughs> yeah, so the giant hogweed obviously has really like quite large leaves. Um, they're really dissected and sharply toothed, and they have a bright green color and they're kind of waxy, um, not to be confused with cow's parsnip. Uh, caraway has a really finely divided fern like leaves and uh, white or black taproot with a white core. And then Queen Anne's lace, um, kind of hard to see in this picture, but it has the really like very finely divided leaves um, and then possibly one purple flower in the middle of the inflorescence. So everyone did really good on that one. the next poll. I'll give this one 10 seconds. And reminder, you can move the, the yeah, you can move the box. around. Yeah. Because <laughs> it probably pops up like right in the middle of the photos. Yeah. Um, and here's just another photo of the second one. It's forming a really dense kind of stand. Okay, I'll give it a few more seconds for everyone to vote. This one's maybe a little bit trickier. Yeah, so most people got this one right too. So the first one is wild parsnip. Um, and it's distinguished by the bright yellow inflorescence versus the white flowers and the other species. And I uh, can't really see it in this photo, but it has um, mitten shaped leaves. And then wild chervil is highly branched with smooth stems. And it can have a deep woody root system. And then poison hemlock um, has the really distinct purple blotches on smooth stems. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go into some invasive plant management tools and ways to report invasive plants. Um, so if you have any questions about ID, you can keep putting them into the chat box. Uh, so one of the uh, invasive plant management tools that we use is the IAP program or the Invasive Alien Plant Program. And some of you may be familiar with this. Um, it's a database for invasive plants and it's used for long-term monitoring of growth and control. And it's also used for data collection and analysis. So it's a sh kind of a central information sharing repository uh, that can be used by any agency. It's used by ministries, regional districts, street committees, um, conservation groups, and many other organizations. Um, and it's help, it helps develop and deliver um, effective invasive plant management. Uh, and the public can use the map display feature um, to find invasive plant sites within BC. Uh, data can be exported and you can run and print activity summary reports. You can also apply to become a user of IAP, um, but most information that you need is available through the map display that the public can access. And there's also going to be a new database and um, system next year that's being developed. Um, the other thing you can do is if you live in our region, you can report invasive plants to us. Um, we often have folks send us photos um, of sites or plants to help with ID or reporting. Or you can use the Report a Weed or Report an Invasive app. So this is an app you can get on your iPhone or uh, smartphone or I iPad. Um, and it has, the Report a Weed app has all of the invasive plants and then Report AIS or Report an Invasive has invasive plants as well as all the other um, invasive species like insects and mammals and fish. And so you can look through invasive species um, and actually report them through that app and it'll give a location of where you are and you can take photos. And yeah, as I said, if you live in our region, you can report um, invasive species to us. Um, yeah, so I just have a bit more time for questions if we have any more, and then I have a bit of information on our um, non-plant species as well. Okay, um, and I just want to go the end here. So th this is the way um, that you can contact us through our website, our phone number, or email. And then um, after this presentation, we'll send a follow-up email with some resources. So we'll have priority lists for our region. Um, we'll send you a guide to the APAC, and this includes um, native species that are in the carrot family, as well as invasive ones. And then I'll send um, some ID mode top invasive plants in the Columbia Shushwap, and we'll send a course feedback or evaluation form. Um, this is the first year that we've done this course online. It's usually in person, so um, we're happy to have any feedback about uh, how the course went for you. And maybe Robin, you can put that in the chat now as well. Um, yeah, there's a few questions that have come in, and I, and I actually am going to be popping off very shortly because okay. I have another another call. So I'll get Kathleen to to maybe pop those links into the chat box for the sure. feedback form. I know she has that too. Um, and just quickly, there was a question about uh, which plant ID book we would recommend for invasives in BC. Um, gosh, there's a, a lot that that we have. <laughs> um, I think it it depends on how extensively you're you're working on plant ID. Um, Guide to Weeds in the West is like a big sort of encyclopedia one. Um, I just love the Poger and McKinnon um, plant books. Um, they have some mostly native plants, but some of the invasive plants. And then there is a provincial small ID book that we would normally be giving out in this course. So please follow up maybe with us, Rob, if you'd like some more recommendations. Um, and obviously there's, there's lots with the reporting app. I don't, I think you went over this already, Kim, with that there's um, a good reporting app that has ID for different species as well. Um, Catherine's asking, is the invasive species location info in IAP 
the same as the, that in BC IMAP. Uh, yes, I do believe those are linked because they're both provincial mapping systems. And Kathleen's now added the link to the feedback form in there and the link for our, uh, the non-plant species, the provincial list for non-plant species. Um, yeah, and I encourage you all to, to continue to reach out for any information and resources. I'm gonna to step away now and let, let you guys wrap up, um, but thanks so much for joining me here today. So I'll let, let Kim finish it off here. Thanks, Robin. Okay, bye everyone. Okay. Um, yeah, so Kathleen also put a link in the chat box to um, the provincial non-plant list. So in our region, we also have a, a list for invasive species that includes um, everything from insects to mammals, birds and reptiles and amphibians, and also um, fungus and diseases. So this is um, quite an extensive list, and we also prioritize these species as well. Um, and the government has uh, priority list for non-plants, so um, you can visit that page. It's, um, yeah, Kathleen has put it in there, and it's also on this slide, so I'll make a PDF of this presentation and send it out to everyone, so you can have all of the ID characteristics that I talked about as well, um, as well as any links or anything that are in the slides. Um, and I just wanted to quickly uh, touch on part of our aquatic program. So as I mentioned, our aquatic field program is mainly focused on monitoring for invasive mussels. Uh, these have not yet been detected in BC, but they were introduced in the 1980s to the Great Lakes region, and they've spread uh, since to many provinces and states, um, but they're not yet in BC or Alberta. So that's a big part of our aquatic program is monitoring for them. Um, and as I said, they have these bisol threads, which allow them to cling to hard substrates. So uh, the province runs inspection stations around the eastern and southern perimeter where they try and inspect every boat that comes into BC. Um, yeah, so one thing that we wanted to talk about is decontamination versus clean, dry, and dry. So when you're, tra when you're traveling um, from outside BC and you're bringing a boat, uh, you want to stop at inspection stations, and these are run by the province of BC. They have conservation officers there that will do an inspection and decontaminate your boat for free if it needs it. Um, versus if you're just moving a boat um, within BC, so if you're moving it to one, one body of water to another, uh, you want to just clean, drain, and dry it, and that's making sure that all water is drained. Um, there's no plants attached to the um, the hull of the boat or the trailer. Um, yeah, and this isn't for CQM, so zebra and quagga mussels, um, they require decontamination versus clean, dry, and dry if you're just going from water bodies uh, in BC. Yeah, so as I said, I'll send out these resources that will help with ID. Um, it's a bit tricky if you're not in person um, to really learn and grasp the ID. So yeah, I encourage you to take a look at uh, these guides and the photos that and posters that I'll be sending back. Um, yeah, and reach out if you have any questions at all. Um, yeah, I don't know, Kathleen, if anything else has popped up in the, the chat box. But thanks everyone for joining us. And yeah, definitely follow up if you have any more questions. Yeah, there's nothing in the chat box right now. Um, also, if there's anything anyone wants me to go back for, if you're taking notes or if you want to um, go back to any of those species in particular, I'm happy to go back in the slides. Yeah. I'm just going to leave it open and feel free to type any questions or unmute yourself if you want to ask anything. Yeah, and thanks so much everyone for attending and um, I know there's lots of folks that weren't from our region so I encourage you can, to connect with any with the uh, invasive species organization in your region as well. Just a quick question. Yeah. Uh, what is um, in your non-plant chart it yeah. had uh, nutria what is that 
Yeah, a nutria is, so they kind of look like a beaver and oh. um, they're from South America and they kind of have, I wonder if I can find a photo of it. Um, they have like bright orange teeth and they don't have like a bushy tail like a, a beaver does. And it's kind of funny because beaver are actually invasive where they're from and nutria can be invasive in North America. So yeah, it's a pretty interesting species. I'll try and find a photo of it for you. Kim, we've got a question. Someone just asked, um, even with your paddle board, you should also ensure wash down, that it's washed down before you're going into another water, water body. Yeah. Yeah, so any kind of watercraft, even um, paddle boards or um, kayaks, just because they can still have um, standing water in them or little um, parts of invasive plants or anything like that. Um, yeah, you definitely just want to make sure it's clean, drained, and dried. Um, but if, yeah, if you were taking a paddle board from somewhere where there was a province where there was zebra and quagga mussels to BC, uh, you have to stop at inspection stations. So, um, yeah, it's ever, any kind of watercraft. Um, and some, someone just added to remind you to talk about fishing boots and weight. Yeah, definitely. So any, as well as watercrafts, um, any kind of fishing gear or gear that's used in the water, um, ropes or felt fishing boots. Um, there's other invasive species like uh, whirling disease that can be transported in mud um, or any kind of, <clears throat> um, yeah. As I said, zebra and quagga mussels can survive in standing water, so anything that holds water uh, could potentially be transporting the larva. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, yeah, anything that's in the water needs to be decontaminated before it comes to BC, if it is coming from somewhere that has um, invasive species that we're worried about. Uh, yeah, and somebody else has mentioned uh, Didymo, which is another invasive, it's also called rock snot. Okay, so somebody has asked um, if just hosing down is sufficient. Um, I would say no, and I'm guessing you're just talking about going in between water bodies in BC. So if you're going from one water body to another, um, it's clean, drain, and dry. So you have to clean it, drain it, and dry it, um, not just hosing down. Um, and then obviously, if you're coming from out of province, it's um, needs to be disinfected and that's with like or decontaminated with hot water and that's at a specific um, temperature that's going to kill the, the larva so yeah it's great there's so many questions about aquatic invasives but um yeah if anybody has questions about plants too i'm happy to answer them Um, yeah, I'm not seeing any more questions. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and you'll see a follow up email from us uh, with some resources and you can fill out the feedback evaluation as well. Um, yeah, I think somebody has raised their hand, but I don't know if they meant to. So unless there's another question, I'm just gonna wrap it up. Thanks a lot. Right. That was really good. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for coming. Yep, thanks, Kim. That was great. Okay. Bye, everyone. <laughs>